Hi, I'm Pastor Ray Fidgel at New Horizon, and I want to welcome you and thank you for engaging with us in uh, worship this week as you uh, view this, share this, and engage with this uh, time of worship uh, online. Um, know that uh, New Horizon is a church that is uh, here for you, and we hope that you'll be in connection with us. Please let us uh, connect with us online and give us your email address, all those kinds of information that helps us be connected with you. And especially as we come towards uh, this season of uh, Lent that begins in, in March, um, and we begin to engage in our faith life in a heightened and, and way that helps us to grow in strength and godliness. I pray that as you share in this today that uh, you will share it with somebody else even and, um, and celebrate God's presence in your life. May you be blessed this day in what we share. May someone else be blessed by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's a good place to be in the presence of God. Is that amen? God's people. I'm always happy to sing about the things of God because he's done so much for me. When I look back on my life and I think about the things that God has done for me, I can only say this is the king of all kings and this is the king of glory. Is that amen?
Yes, the world bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why we? Just wanna be with you. Sing with me. Yes, the world bow down and say you are. Every man bow down and say you are king. So let's start. So let's start right now. Why?
We love our lists, don't we? How many in here, you know, like to make lists? You know, you like to make your list, you know, you write your list down. You got to have all those things, you know, that you have to do or that you have to get and you check them off and, uh, oh, it feels so good to check things off your list, right? It feels so good. We love our list. You know, we make our, our grocery list. We write down all the things that we need to get and we we go to the store and you're wandering around the store and you pick something up and you check it off the list and you pick the next thing up and you check it off the list and then you're just hoping that the store has everything that you're looking for uh, because if you walk out of there and there's one or two things that you haven't gotten, it's like, ah, oh, I'm going to have to go to another store. But then if you do get everything checked off, woohoo, you win, right? <laughs> you win if you get everything checked off your list. And our to-do lists are the same way. You know, we, we love our to-do list. You know, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And whether you make a daily list or a weekly list, you know, you're always wanting, do I get this done? Did I take care of this? Or oh, and I plan to do this. In fact, tech people knew well that we love our list, and they built list-making devices into all programs of technology. You know, our calendars, they're not just calendars. They have to-do lists built into them. You know, so that we can easily put it in there and little buttons for us to hit when we check off the to-do list. You know, we check something off and it puts a nice little red line through it or a little check beside it, you know, and we've done it and we get down our list and we go down everything and we've got everything done. And at the end, we win, you know, because you've checked everything off. Wouldn't it be just awesome if that's the way Christianity was, A following Christ was just a checklist. A checklist. Christianity following Christ is not a checklist. It's not that list like, well, I delivered some food today to Nourishing Lives. I know the cereal was about to go out of date, but they'll eat it pretty quickly. Check. You know, I did that today. And uh, I, I didn't murder the guy that cut me off in traffic and made me screech on my brakes and stop. So no killing anybody today. Check. Okay, I, I, I did that, all right? So um, I did a very nice thing for my spouse. I did a very, it was very inconvenient. It was very hard, it was very inconvenient, but I did a nice thing for myself. So I did a nice, I did my good deed, check, okay? I was coming off the highway. There was a guy standing there with a sign, you know, that needed something. I gave him a bottle of water and all the change in my cup holder, all right? Check. I made a donation today, you know, gave a little bit, check, you know, I, I did that. Um, I, uh, I said a prayer, you know, I, I was saying a prayer, oh, oh Lord, please let me finish my grocery list today, and I did, and God answered my prayer, you know, I read the Bible today, it was on a sign in a store, it said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, and I know that scripture, so check, I read the Bible today, you know. Um, I, uh, I was, left a nice tip for the server, you know, check. And now let me go down the big 10, right? The big 10, you shall have no other gods before you. Of course, I don't have any other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Of course, I remember the Sabbath day. I turned on the YouTube and listened to the worship service while I folded my laundry, you know, check. I did that, you know, honor your father and mother. Ooh, better remember to call my parents today. Better remember to do that. Um, let's see. No lying. Didn't do that. Uh, don't uh, covet anything your neighbor has. No, I don't covet what they have. They they want what I got. You know. Uh, you, you know. You know. No lying. No cheating. No stealing. Didn't do any of those things. Check. 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 I win. Right. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I checked everything off the list. I followed the rules as best as I can. And when I can't follow the rules, God is forgiving, right? God is very forgiving. And so 
I was nice, I was friendly, and that is what Christianity is. I win. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid that Christianity should be about anything as unreasonable as love your enemies. You know, and pray for those who hurt you and do good to those who are actively your enemies. Because here's the thing. We know what that is to have that dividing line between us and them, right? We know what an enemy is. We know what an opposition is. And heaven forbid that the Christianity is more than a checklist that is actually about this character of loving people on the other side of the lines that we draw in our lives and the lines that our culture draws for us. We live in a divisive world, don't we? We live in a very divisive world. We divide around politics. We divide around race. We divide around how we deal with race relations. We divide around, particularly here in South Florida, around language and, and who speaks what language. We divide around our socioeconomics. You don't want to go into this neighborhood. You don't want to go into that neighborhood. You know, those kinds of things. We make divisions about that. We make divisions about masks, whether to wear masks, not to wear masks. We make decisions. We we're divided over vaccines, right? This is right, this is right, da-da-da. We have all these divisions. And, you know, and I'm walking around our neighborhood, my neighborhood, and there are people that have banners and flags and signs in the yards that, that I have to say, that are extremely offensive to me. They're offensive. And God wants me to love them? Because here's the thing. If I go into a public space a park or a school, and I start talking about Jesus, people get offended and I get pushed away. You know, we, we live in this divisive thing and, and Jesus has this unreasonable expectation that we're going to love those who are on the other side of the, of the line and love people who have hurt us, love them, love people who have actively worked against us. We're just too different from that. This is a very unreasonable thing. How in the world do we do this? How? How, how, how? Practice. So years ago, I, I served a church that was in this area of Florida, um, a very unique area in Florida. You don't see this too often. Lots of people came down during the winter months who were retired. You know, we know all of Florida is like that. That's all of Florida. But I lived in this area that was just a, a magnet for people that uh, came down. And, uh, and the community, the church community, was, was mostly retirees. And, and the church would triple or even quadruple in size between Christmas and Easter during those, those winter months. So it really wasn't that big a church, but became fairly large during a few months out of the year. And um, people started treating me a little different than what I expected as a pastor. I was almost treated like the waiter who forgot to bring you your food, you know? It was like, you better do this and you better do that. And then I found out that there's all these rumors and phone calls and people in the community saying, you know what the church doesn't do? You know what the pastor didn't do? You know, they didn't do this. They didn't do that. They didn't do this. And, you know, and people were actively working against some of the ministries that we were putting into place. There were actually this division. And, of course, in the middle of that division was the one full-time staff person, the pastor. And so it was always the pastor's fault when something didn't happen the way they wanted it to go. And I'll never forget the first time that I went to see someone in the hospital who was facing surgery. And they looked at me with these surprised eyes and they said, Oh, all these people told me that you would never come. Because that's not what our church does. What? And I began to find out that all these people held all this ill feeling for the other work that was being done in the church. And of course, it was always the pastor's fault. And so all of the ridicule and the derision and the infighting and the rumors were always about the pastor. And one person at a time, I would show up when they needed surgery when they were on their deathbed and their family said, oh, we thought no one from the church would care. 
I did their funerals. I made their visits just one at a time. Some people came to my office crying, saying, oh, they told me this and you were so nice and asked for forgiveness. Others just went off into their mad huff. Some continued the battle. But I'll tell you the blessing I got. I learned to be patient. I learned to be tolerant. My capacity for love grew. It's amazing what happens when you practice just one act at a time of good deeds towards someone who speaks ill of you, who hurts you, who hurts your family. And what develops in your own heart is this character that reflects maybe a little bit more of the kingdom. Just practice a few, a one or two tangible actions. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who would hurt you or who have hurt you. And you'll begin to see the animosity melt away. Bless those. In other words, bless people. In other words, do something good towards people who are not like you and maybe don't like you. Do something good for somebody that you would never hang out with. Do something good for them. This idealism of Jesus that he talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, this idealism, this stuff starts to become a reality when it's practiced just one little step at a time. Jesus is only asking us to take one action, the next one. The next action. Jesus teaches about an ideal and the kingdom of God. Heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Loving and caring for each other, that kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Loving your enemies, forgiving those who hurt you. This is an ideal. It's absolutely impossible. But Jesus says, just take one action at a time. Act out of love. Bless someone. Bless someone. Do something that will actually increase and encourage their lives. Do something good. Be generous. Be generous. Give. Give to encourage others and, and give, your, give your money. Yes, not your, only your time, but give your time and your money and let it encourage and lift others up. Pray for those who hurt you. One act at a time. Love. Bless. Give. Pray. One action at a time. And it begins to build a character in us that overflows with the kingdom. Did you hear what Jesus said about what it builds a character in us? It's, it's like this marketplace measuring kind of thing. It'll be this blessing that's, that's packed down, shaken, overflowing. Do you know when you're measuring something and you shake it a little bit and it gets down so you can get more in there and you get more in there and you get more in there? You know, the more you do it, the more blessing you get, the more your cup is full, the more your, your cup overflows. So I read this beautiful story this week about this a couple who were Javanese Christians. And they had moved into a new area of Jakara. And Jakara is an area of, um, of Indonesia. And uh, these, uh, this couple, these were Javanese Christians, which is quite a minority in this community. There was a, uh, the Indonesian major religion is different than Christianity. But this couple moved into this neighborhood, and they wanted to meet their neighbors. They wanted to make friends. They wanted to be generous and make, make friends, and so they baked little cakes. They baked these little cakes, and they took it to one neighbor on one side, and they took it to another neighbor on the other side, and they began to share kind words, and they were rebuffed. Their little cakes were thrown into the trash and thrown into the dirt. Harsh and angry words were, were spoken uh, to them. Um, they, these words of rejection and dismissal, and they were pushed out. And this couple, they were very kind of soft-spoken. They were unassuming. They weren't 
those kind of out there people that proclaim the word. They were just kind of quiet little folks. And so they went about their lives and they shared their story and their little community that they would gather with. On Sunday mornings, they would get up and they'd get their Bible and they'd begin to walk to their little gathering, very much a minority in the, in the place where they lived. But each Sunday, their way would be blocked by those who were threatening and deriding them and putting them down. There would be men that would follow them in a very threatening way through their neighborhood. And uh, they would receive these insults and loud shouts of disdain and, and anger and, and frustration at them. And so they just continued to, to hear these taunts. But over time, as they continued to go to their little group and as they continued to be in the community, of course, people got tired, the tensions be kind of dropped a little bit, and, and the taunts began to fade away. And they continued to be neighborly. When the rainy season came, they offered their, helps to, their help to help people patch their roofs and to, to fix the, uh, the leaks during the heavy rainy seasons. And after four years, after four years of, of being in this community, they actually established a few friends. And neighbors would actually come by their house and, and actually have conversations and ask them about raising kids and about their marriage and things like that. And they would join together to do things in the community, like sharing cards during holy days of both religions. And then there were days when the neighbors actually brought them a case, brought them a gift. It's just one act at a time. It's a practice. How do we do it? How do we love better? How do we have this love of the kingdom and develop this kingdom kind of love? It's just one simple little act at a time. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. I remember reading a story about a mom who prayed for the young man in prison who killed her son. She prayed for him until her anger and her pain and her grief began to diminish. What a blessing, right? Pray for your enemies. And it begins to soothe the hate and the grievance and the pain and the anguish that can fill our hearts if we cling to it. Bless those who hurt you. When you begin to do good and to do blessings towards those who hurt you, it begins to form a power of forgiveness in our own lives. Give generously. Generosity is a, is a key. Have you ever heard of somebody who was stingy and a very good at loving people? You know, they don't go together. You know, give generously. Generosity is a key component of love. And practicing generosity and giving generosity begins to build that capacity of love within us by giving and giving and giving and giving. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who hurt you. Give generously. And love begins to overflow. It takes practice. Not a checklist. Did this, did this, did this. Was nice to people and I'm good. That's not what it is. It's a practice. It is a lifestyle. A lifestyle of practicing prayer, practicing doing good, blessing other people, practicing generous giving until extravagant, unexpected, unbelievable love is produced in our hearts and in our church and in our community and in our world. Amen and amen. Oh Lord, we dare to risk this prayer this day. Show us the next act of blessing, giving, that you would have us do for those who are so different and hurtful towards us.
Show us the next thing, Lord, to practice doing in the name of your kingdom. Amen. Amen.